Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Can you hear me okay in the back? I'm not sure if this microphone's working. Are we good on sound? Well, you need a microphone. Do we have it working? Do you know? Is it on? Okay, well, I will assume it's on and I'll try to project that direction. Good afternoon again, and welcome to this afternoon's inaugural lecture for featuring Professor Shannon Winnips of the <laughs> Department of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies. As you might know, the inaugural lecture series is designed to highlight the research of our division's newest full professors, those whose promotions to the rank of professors were approved by the Board of Trustees effective this academic year. In Shannon's case, we're making an exception, a time delay exception to that general rule. She was promoted some years ago, uh, but for a variety of reasons, her celebration was delayed until today. Profession to, I'm sorry, promotion to professor in the College of Arts and Sciences is dependent on demonstrated excellence in research or creative activity, demonstrated excellence in teaching, and in service to the department and the university and the professions and publics that operate beyond campus. This afternoon's lecture is the seventh in this year's series. And today we celebrate Shannon's professional journey to professor of WGSS. Shannon earned a BA in liberal studies from the University of Notre Dame and an MA and a PhD in philosophy from Penn State University. She taught in the Department of Religion and Philosophy at Southwestern University where she was promoted to professor and held the Caroline and Fred McManus chair in philosophy prior to joining the faculty at Ohio State in 2008. Shannon has demonstrated excellence in research in the field of philosophy. Her research focuses on continental philosophy and its intersections with feminism and queer theory. I think I've just started your slideshow. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's not clear. <laughs> Her research is also developed into the so-called sprawling scholarship of neoliberalism. Shannon has published two books, Queering Freedom in 2006 with Indiana University Press and Way Too Cool in 2015 at Columbia University Press. And that title is, I should say, way too cool of a title. <laughs> she was also the editor of Reading Bataya, published in 2006 by Indiana and included in 2000, as a 2007 choice outstanding title. Shannon has received exceptional international and external praise for Way Too Cool. Cynthia Willett of Emory University wrote, and here I'm quoting, I cannot emphasize enough the respect that Professor Winnips generated among philosophers in the pluralist traditions, including phenomenology, existentialism, post-structuralism, race theory, and feminist philosophy. Shannon also has maintained an active record of presentations, including several invited keynote addresses and plenary lectures. Her promotion review confirmed that Shannon is highly regarded by her professional peers who emphasized her significant scholarship on race, sexuality, and feminist philosophy. The promotion review also confirmed the interdisciplinary impact of her work by emphasizing its enthusiastic reception by external evaluators. Shannon has established excellence in teaching. Extensive peer and student evaluations speak to her merit in the classroom. Student evaluation comments are consistently positive and supportive. Her peers cite their appreciation for her ability to navigate difficult and controversial material on race and sexuality. Shannon serves now as advisor for two doctoral students and she has been a dissertation committee member for four completed and four current doctoral students. In addition, she has chaired four candidacy exam committees and served on six others and has advised several master's <coughs> students. Shannon has a clear record of contribution to the teaching mission of her department. Shannon's service record exudes excellence. She has built a distinguished record of service at the university and in the profession. She has served as co-editor for the journal Philosophia, as a peer reviewer for several journals and university presses, and as chair of the advisory book selection committee for the Society of Phenomenology and Existential Philosophy. 
Here at Ohio State, she has served on the College Curriculum Committee and has directed the university's interdisciplinary program in sexuality studies. And as you certainly know, she currently chairs the Department of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies. This afternoon, Shannon will deliver her inaugural lecture titled Doors, an Object Lesson in Race and Sexuality, and featuring this slide <laughs> along the way. Please join me now in congratulating her on her promotion and welcoming her to the podium, Shannon. that up a bit. Um, thanks to all of you for coming out this afternoon. I really appreciate it. Um, as Peter mentioned, I was promoted a, a couple of years ago and for a variety of reasons delayed. And I will also say that for a variety of reasons finally gave in to giving this lecture. Uh, as my uh, beloved colleagues in the departments of women's gender and sexuality studies kept asking when it was going to be. So um, it really is great to see so many of you here and, uh, and so many friends and colleagues. So I appreciate it very much. It's not an easy lecture to put together. It's a strange genre of lecture. So I will, with that uh, caveat, jump in. So I have probably outdone myself on the technology front, but we will hope for the best. <laughs> uh, I'd like to begin with a clip so I'm beginning with a, uh, a film clip from director D. Rees' 2017 film, Mudbound. Henry's marriage proposal didn't play out like I pictured it would. It wasn't me or anyone. The question came out as marriage statement. Henry wasn't romantic. He was made of dirty as dust. It is an iconic scene of heterosexual romance. The newly wedded couple crossing the domestic threshold, complete with the man carrying his wife. Henry, we learn across the film, is a heartless man, but not a violent one. In the opening scene of the film, a scene in which, a scene what I would call of retributive justice, wherein Henry is forced to, to bury his despicably bigoted father in a former slave's grave. Henry's youngest brother describes Henry as the type of man who was, quote, absolutely certain that whatever he wanted to happen would. Henry is, in other words, a very typical white man, <laughs> a man who goes along with the bigotry of post-World War II Jim Crow Mississippi enforcing and benefiting from it, but never donning a Klansman's hood. Mudbound is a remarkable film, one that represents histories of race and racism in the United States without the typical pornotroping violence and liberal sentimentality that structures so much of the history of film on race and racism. In this scene alone, director Dee Rees, who is a US black female director and writer, incisively captures the power of the domestic threshold in the patriarchal gendering of white lives. As feminist scholars have analyzed for a very long time, the domestic threshold anchors the patriarchal system of gender. The masculine achieves all that is brave and strong and true in the public realm while the feminine nurtures his children in a clean and tidy, well-ordered home. The scene, of course, ends in the kitchen. But as both the film and feminist scholars also make clear, this is explicitly a white formation of the domestic, a formation that Rees unravels, explores, and upends with stunning clarity and nuance across this film. I'll return to Mudbound but I begin with this one scene to initiate a study of doors, particularly of doors as object lessons 
of race and sexuality, as my title promises, and ultimately as object lessons of the treasured category, the human. In my current work, I'm attempting to track some of the ways that race has been routed and rerouted through facially non-racialized cultural formations. My hope through this work is to cultivate a broader epistemological and affective syntax than that of classical liberalism for the complexities of race and racism in US culture. Taking my point of departure from Dion Brand's work on the door of no return, I am obsessing these days about how particular doors function as fetishes that obscure and deflect while also denying and shaping cultural relations to the door of no return and the singular foundational ontology of anti-blackness that it initiates. Today, I'm only going to explore one of those doors. If you want to ask me about my other obsessions, I'm happy to talk about them. Uh, but today, I'm only exploring the door of the domestic bourgeois bedroom. <clears throat> In Lose Your Mother, A Journey Along the Atlantic Slave Route, Saidia Hartman meditates on her impossible desire to return to the roots of her bloodline in Ghana. In scene after scene of complex histories and affects, Hartman immerses readers in the various landscapes surrounding Elmina Castle, the first building erected by the Portuguese in 1482 to house and transport slaves. Hartman tells us early on that, that, that she came to Ghana seeking among other phenomena, quote, not the ancestral village, but the barracoon, the enclosure in which slaves were warehoused between capture and departure. Despite her desperation, quote, to reclaim the dead, to reckon with the lives undone and obliterated in the making of human commodities, close quote, Hartman knows all too well the trappings, lures, and impossibilities of such reconstituting labor in the archive. The obstacles here are both hermeneutic and ontological. She worries always about the pornotropic habit of rendering the violence of enslavement exquisite, exquisitely graphic and thereby pleasurable, as she teaches us in her canonical scenes of subjection. And she also worries over the seduction of solace and self-consolation that restorative archival labor can produce, as she articulates directly in Venus in Two Acts. But Hartman strikingly writes these quandaries of representation directly in an ontological register, echoing the language of Hortense Spillers to state explicitly, quote, this is Hartman, Commodities, cargo, and things don't lend themselves to representation. This ontological register confronts us with the singularity of the catastrophe that is the transatlantic slave trade. As Hartman writes directly in Lose Your Mother, and as Christina Sharp has elaborated recently in her book In the Wake on Blackness and Being, the reduction of human lives to commodities and capital, renders the transatlantic slave trade a singular event that is foundational to capitalism, which has always been globalized. As Hartman states directly in Lose Your Mother, this is Hartman, quote, unlike the concentration camp, the gulag, and the killing field, which had as their intended end the extermination of a population, the Atlantic trade created millions of corpses, but as a corollary to the making of commodities." Close quote. This killing as corollary to commodities and capital occurs not through, not through an incipient taxonomy of racial differences. Those don't really emerge until the 19th century. The mechanism that produces this ontological singularity is the systemic application of geometric, arithmetic, and economic calculations 
to the enslaved as cargo, as commodities, and also as commodities that can reproduce. The hallmark of capital, and as I will develop in a moment, also the hallmark of ungendering black bodies. Ontologically fungible, the enslaved were held in storehouses that were intended to, that were intended to store non-human goods. The barracoons were, quote, this is still Hartman, burrowed deep in the earth, resembling tombs. But as Hartman tells us, the British, who are the ones who designed these underground storerooms explicitly to warehouse slaves, the British refer to this dungeon, the barracoon, as a factory. That is, as a site that, again, as Hartman puts it, transforms waste into capital. So I want to stay with this waste in an effort to build this site of the barracoon and the door of no return that is its one-way threshold into a transcendental condition of modern consciousness and life. This waste signifies both the colonial imaginary that deemed, damns all non-European lives to the category of the useless and also signifies the literal physical excrement that covered the floor of the barracoon. In one of the only scenes from Elmina Castle that Hartman describes with any graphic detail, she elaborates the barracoon. And this is her long description. Human waste covered the floor of the dungeon. To the naked eye, it looked like soot. After the last group of captives had been deported, the holding cells were closed but never cleaned out. For a century and a half after the abolition of the slave trade, the waste remained. To control the stench and the pestilence, the floor had been covered with sand and lime. In 1972, a team of archaeologists excavated the dungeon and cleared away 18 inches of dirt and waste. They identified the topmost layer of the floor as the compressed remains of captives, feces, blood, and exfoliated skin." Close quote. How, I'm asking, does this site of sedimented, sticky, material waste function as a transcendental condition of possibility of our lives? How especially does it function not so much as the disavowed condition of that transcendental structure, but, and here I am following the thinking of Georges Bataille, rather as the base materialism that animates, energizes, and eroticizes all transcendental structures. That is, how, I'm asking, does this site of sedimented, sticky material waste animate the traditional, con the, the transcendental conditional the transcendental condition of possibility of our lives, and by that I mean of all of our lives, in the 21st century of globalized capitalism, and specifically, I want to ask, in the lives of white persons. In A Map to the Door of No Return, Dion Brand takes up the phrase, the door of no return, as a metonym for the catastrophe of the Atlantic chattel slave trade. Having never visited Elmina Castle or Gory Island, where the door of no return is named, or any of the dozens of so-called slave castles along the Gold Coast of West Africa, Dion Brand writes the door of the door of no return as what she calls, as a poet, a place, a place, real, imaginary, and imagined. Yes, it refers literally to the historical doors through which enslaved bodies were forced to be loaded as cargo from the barracoons into the holds of the ships headed for the New World. It was, as Brand writes, quote, the door of a million exits multiplied. In her poetic renderings, the door of no return circulates as a foundational space of black consciousness in the diaspora, spurred by the singular catastrophe. 
as she puts it, quote, I think blacks carry the diaspora, I think blacks in the diaspora carry the door of no return in our senses. Like Hartman, Brand writes the door of no return into existence to signify a singular ontology. She writes, the door, the return in the door of no return is one of irrecoverable losses of those very things which make returning possible. The door signifies the historical moment which colors all moments in the diaspora. Both an historical and material phenomenon then, the door of no return, that is the threshold that moves strictly in one direction from the barracoon to the slave ship, functions as consciousness for brand. That's her phrase. The door of no return functions, again, as I'm saying, as a transcendental condition of possibility for what Hartman calls the afterlife of slavery. It signifies the historical event of the foundational violence of anti-blackness, an event that carries, I'm arguing, an ontological singularity, rendering it a past that is never past. Brand tells us that to live at the door of no return, this is her phrase, to live at the door of no return is to live self-consciously. What might this idea of living at the door of no return mean? More specifically, what might it mean for whites and this complex thing we call whites to live with this consciousness? Is it possible for whites to carry the door of no return in our senses? If it functions as the singular transcendental condition of possibility of our lives, aren't we always already carrying it in our senses? How are we always already breathing and feeling and living it? To reckon with the door of no return for whites is uh, clearly not an easy thing, but it is to reckon with it from the other side of the door. We must reckon with the door and the barracoon from our position as builders and designers, as captors and purveyors of the cargo across extensive economic and political and cultural circuits. We must reckon with the naked violence of pure greed that forces the captured bodies across the threshold. Such unadorned violence is not easily approached. It, function, it functions precisely as that which must be disavowed in the name of civilization, of modernity, and of humanity. Consequently, while a direct confrontation and cathexis with this violence is surely a necessary piece of bringing whites to live at the door of no return. It also seems to me that it's insufficient. To be sure, this resonance of this violence still captures my attention, particularly as it bends a European archive on the pleasures of violence, especially sexual violence, towards a missing object, calling forth the eroticizing mechanisms of fetishism. But as a constitutively disavowed event, this founding violence of anti-blackness, with all its messy and, and gory base materialism, the sticky material waste, has also been routed and abstracted through many cultural formations. And that's what I'm interested in sorting out. And the one I'm gonna focus on today is sexuality. Hoping that I've made some modicum of sense, then I'll turn to this. The singular ontology of the door of no return <coughs> is, uh, to me, a, a radical reorientation. Radical in the sense of pulling things up at their roots. It alters the geo-historic axis for the conceptualization of race from the habitual 18th, 19th century European US axis back towards the 15th century transatlantic circuits of capture, forced removal, and enslavement 
of those discovered by colonial exploration. So in the time that, that I have with you today, I can only sketch some of the impacts of this reorientation. So this strikes me as a comically fast, but so things go. Uh, it seems to me that this, this reorientation unmoors the epistolo epistemological and affective syntaxes of classically liberal sentimentality, which is housed in the normative concept of subjectivity as interior, individual, and snared by the eternal struggle to be purely rational, the alleged seat of choice. These foundational fealties ground normative concepts of the human, which renders race an unfortunate aberration to be neutralized and overcome, whether through the rhetoric of inclusion performed by legal principles, such as equality and rights, or the force of state power performed by enslavement, Jim Crow, and mass incarceration. The progress narrative ensures the ongoing pursuit of the dream of equality that is also always the dream of erasing race. So all of these foundational concepts, sentimentality, interiority, individualism, rationality, and choice, also ground the complex apparatus that we call sexuality. Therefore, continuing to follow, right, I'm just following here, continuing to follow the long-standing work of black feminists who have argued for over 40 years that we cannot conceptualize race without simultaneously conceptualizing sexuality, I argue that we should revisit and rewire our frameworks for analyzing and representing sexuality as they stand in relation to the door of no return. So how, that is, has the door of the domestic bourgeois bedroom not only obscured the door of no return, but also rerouted our attention, our epistemologies, our cathexes, our desires, our pleasures, and our senses from this founding violence. How, just in case we weren't always there, already there to put us into total rhetorical overdrive, has sexuality rendered the foundational anti-black ontology in whiteface. So I'm going to turn back to Mudbound, where the role of sexuality diffracts and shapes the differing racialized affects that the film produces through both its presence and its absence. The scene I'm going to cue is, is just one of only two scenes of sex in the film. Earlier in the film, the wife, Laura, has explained that Henry's lack of romanticism, his heartlessness, is not an obstacle to granting her what she wants. She is a strong woman, but still a white woman, who, who longs for her proper place in the world, to be a wife. This utilitarian logic strips all romantic overtures from this home. As Laura has put it in a, in a scene prior to this one, not exactly prior, but previous to this one, she says, I never enjoyed Henry's lovemaking, but it did make me feel like a wife. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just going to take me a second to get there. Oh, I shouldn't be letting you see the film, but whatever. It's a Netflix original up for Academy Awards, so you too can watch it. OK. Good. hardly a romantic or even remotely erotic scene. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> hardly 
a romantic or even remotely erotic scene. It lays bare the logic of the first scene I showed, the iconic scene of crossing the domestic threshold. The romance of him carrying her across the threshold of their new home symbolizes, of course, the sexual act whereby the man breaks the virginal wife hymen and thereby lies, lays claim to her as his property in the sanctity of their marital bed. Years later, for this couple, hopefully not for all, <laughs> the act of sex still directly enacts this power and, lo and logic of property ownership. As I said at the beginning, none of this is news to feminist scholars. Nor does this scene of boring mechanical sex live up to the expectations of what a queer theorist ought to be delivering to you, <laughs> especially on a, on a cold and wintry Friday afternoon. <laughs> My apologies. I show you this scene from Mudbound to sharpen our focus on the precise door that animates the iconic threshold of the domestic, namely the door of the domestic bourgeois bedroom, or aspirationally bourgeois. While the domestic threshold anchors normative gender mechanisms to the complex apparatus of, oh sorry, while the domestic threshold anchors normative gender mechanisms, queer theory consistently disaggregates and reaggregates these normative gender mechanisms to the complex apparatus of sexuality, where desires and pleasures are always the central foci. For my queer feminist work, it's explicitly the door of the domestic bourgeois bedroom that becomes the critical threshold, namely the threshold through which the sticky, wet, messy, base materialism of sex acts must be sublated and sublimated into the symbolic capital of normative, legible, and acceptable identities. The mechanisms that flow in and out and across this door of the domestic bourgeois bedroom are what Michel Foucault, in his canonical volume one of the history of sexuality, names the complex apparatus of sexuality. So, given the remarkable circulation of that text and its impact on scholarship across the last 30 to 40 years, and in the interest of time, I'm just going to assume we are vaguely familiar with it. Uh, and and cut to the, 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 the precise figure of the domestic bourgeois bedroom in Foucault's accounts. And again, I want to approach this domestic bourgeois bedroom door in Foucault's accounts from the perspective of the door of no return. Uh, <clears throat> so in that book, right, the space of the parental conjugal bedroom is framed as anchoring natural sexuality by the repressive hypothesis, right? And then Foucault just debunks that story and begins to tell his own story. It seems to me that readers have often glossed past the critical role that that same bedroom plays in Foucault's accounts of what's called the perverse incantation, wherein he argues that perversions are not, and sexuality is not repressed, but rather incited codified, produced, and regulated across 18th and 19th century practices and documents of Northern Western Europe, which is his argument. In those accounts, the figure of the domestic bourgeois bedroom exerts its force in one of the most troubling of Foucault's examples. And for those of you who do know the text, you'll recognize this, I think, as one of his most troubling examples the story of Jouy, the farmhand from Lap Court, France in 1867. I appreciate the nods. <laughs> As Foucault, Foucault tells that story, he casts the farmhand as mentally, a mentally, intellectually challenged loner, what he calls, quote, somewhat simple-minded, living hand to mouth, sleeping in barns and stables, who innocently played games of, quote, curdled milk, quote, obtaining a few caresses from a little girl, just as he had done before and seen done by the village urchins round about him, at the edge of the wood or in the ditch by the road, close quote. 
upon the emergence, as, as Foucault tells it, upon the emergence of the legal medical apparatus. However, Jouy is indicted as perverse and carted off for diagnoses and intervention. This figure of Jouy is always one of the most difficult for us early 21st century readers, especially feminist readers who may want to scream out, me too, on behalf of the little 19th century girls. In that, and I appreciate the laughter, uh, in that section of the text, Foucault is charting the full emergence of sexuality as a complex codified system of discourses that forces sex to speak. As he puts it, quote, sex was constrained to lead a discursive existence, scattered and multiplied in an explosion of distinct discursivities, close quote. In all the focus on that discursive explosion and its normalizing grids, however, I think we've largely lost sight of one of its fundamental anchors, the, do the domestic bourgeois bedroom. It is not so much that Jouy performs perverse sex acts, but that he does so in the wrong place. He's unprotected by bourgeois domesticity and its sacred marital bedroom. He has failed to secure the place of the proper citizen as John Locke prescribes it through the twin logics of enclosure and private property. This norm of the enclosed, privately owned, bourgeois domestic bedroom, Foucault tells us, functions as all powerful norms do, quietly, even silently, not cacophonously. So it's that quiet anchoring of, sexual, of modern sexuality in the domestic bedroom signifies quite differently, I think, when we read it from the door of no return. So I'm gonna conclude here with a final turn to the work of Hortense Spillers. <clears throat> in her groundbreaking 1867, 1960, were it only 1867, <laughs> 1987 classic. That was a good Freudian slip, that was good. That was all good. Alas, it was in 1987. Uh, classic, Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe, an American grammar book. Spillers places us in the scene that the door of no return initiates, the holds of the transatlantic slave ships in the 15th century. In those holds, she enumerates the alteration of human tissue that renders captive slaves, in her terms, ungendered, and unhuman. This alteration cannot, oh good, this alteration of human tissue occurs both violently and mathematically. Spillers develops the concept of, concept of pornotroping, which I've already invoked, to elaborate this ungendering violence, which paradigmatically takes the form of rape and continues to animate representations of the violence for white audiences and readers. But physical sexualized violence is not the only tool of ungendering. Spillers also emphasizes the critical tool of mathematics, namely of the geometric and arithmetic calculations that quantified female and male flesh according to the same rules of accounting. No. <laughs> Reading from the archive of a captain's ledgers for a slave ship, Spillers relays, quote, every man slave is to be allowed six feet by one foot four inches for room, every woman five feet 10 by one foot four, every boar, boy five feet by one foot two, and every girl four feet six by one foot, close quote. In the abstraction of property and capital, which become the only markers of difference between these bodies, captured bodies are reduced to measurable units of cargo. As Spillers elaborates, these bodies register in the counting books as, quote, 
neither female nor male, but as quantities. The female in the middle passage, as apparently the smaller physical mass, occupies less room, close quote, in the calculation of capital and profit. This abstraction of waste and violence into epistemologies of calculation persists, leading scholars such as Catherine McKittrick and Riley Snorton to continue to elaborate what McKittrick calls the mathematics of black life. For Spillers, both the violence and the quantified logic of accounting render the flesh of slaves ungendered. While she locates the tools of this ungendering in the holds of the slave ships, she explains that the normative concept of gender comes from the same site of the emergence of sexuality in Foucault, the domestic. As Spillers writes explicitly, quote, the human cargo of a slave vessel contravenes notions of the domestic, close quote. Again, it's not that this anchoring of both gender and sexuality in the domestic is new, but Spiller's incitement of it in the tools of violence that constitute the 15th century transatlantic slave trade reorients the usual geohistoric axis and puts it directly in relation to the door of no return. This, I'm arguing, will lead to a rewiring of Foucault's accounts of sexuality at their roots, rendering the emergence of sexuality as a matter not so much of discursive normalizing grids, although that too, but also and always of foundational anti-blackness. Let me, let me repeat that. Anchored in domesticity, sexuality emerges not only as the complex discursive normalizing grids that Foucault sets out and that are surely true but it's also a powerful, schematizing armature of foundational anti-blackness. Sexuality, that is, with all its normalizing and inciting power, especially the force to catch and trap us in the deep interiorities of intrinsic desires that structure our identities, must, I think, now be reconsidered as a complex and nuanced play of anti-black white face minstrelsy. And that's one of the projects that I'm now pursuing. Thanks. So you're talking about, so I, this is going to be about the movie, so you can all watch the movie. <laughs> um, but you're talking about the white soldier in particular, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think the film's remarkable for a lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. and, and some of it, and I haven't done a lot of research that I want to do on it. But I, I think that it's um, particularly remarkable for the way that it doesn't easily give in to some of the usual tropes we have about black and white families in Jim Crow, Mississippi, right? And so while we have the despicably bigoted father and he's really over the top and he ends up, there ends up being a, a scene of torture by the Klan on this man who returns from war, a black man, it's not given in the usual ways 
that it's the centerpiece of the movie by any, any sense, right? And so that is sort of off to the side, right? And while he's a despicable bigot, he's always cast as the despicable bigot. It's like we, all the representational systems set it up so that you hate him. So it's all sort of perfectly easy, right? And so the question of how racism is then working seems to me to be much more interesting in how the white families and the ways we're seeing their, which is why I showed these two scenes, they are, they're, they're contrasted with scenes of the black family who are, who are, you saw it leading into that one scene, sitting down for dinner, right? And having a very strong domestic sense of, of life. And the only sweet romantic scene we see in the whole film is of the black couple. Right, and they're dancing and singing. I don't know if you've gotten that far. Um, so I think it's remarkable for those kinds of reasons. What I'm trying to do with the door of no return, and 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 you can see that I'm, I may have gotten promoted, but I'm not wise. I mean, I didn't I didn't give you my, my all the work I've been doing or old work. I just said, oh, opportunity to do new work, great. Um, what I'm trying to do there, right? is to think that, <clears throat> is to orient us as whites towards the singular door. So I really want to fasten on the singularity of it, that we can't find it transposed in other doors. And to think about it outside of trauma. Because I think when we, because that's not to say, I mean, the cathexis with trauma is huge. And that is animating a great deal of black feminist theorizing on this scene, and that's clearly what I'm, what I'm working with and learning from. However, to position whites in that position of trauma, right, is too easy. It sets us up too much as the savior or the, or the progress narrative, it does those things, but it also reinvents the trauma constantly. And so, there's two things. One, I want to hold on to the singularity of the door of no return. So I'm really <laughs> insistent that it's singular and that we can't find it in other doors. Two, I want to lose my train of thought. I want to, um, oh, come on. Separate from trauma? Sure. <laughs> I want to, yeah. I mean, I want, I don't know, I, I, I do forget, but I, I, I want to um, try, to orient us towards that violence, not only in its physical formations, and its, in its emotional formations. That's why I'm so interested in this abstraction, right? Because it's always about abstraction. So that's part of an answer. I also think it's totally weird that the movie's supposedly about these two guys returning home from war, and that doesn't happen until two thirds of the way into the film. <laughs> They're not the important parts of that film, I don't think. So, yes. You, yeah. I just want to make okay. Uh, I might great talk. Thanks so much. Your account and your uh, your account is beautiful of, of what you're doing, but also I'm really attached and um, invested in this idea of world making. Um, uh, different okay. world making. Um, so really, it's a, it's a very popular story, but it's about how you're doing a world making from your point of view. And to this, to this, my idea or my my comment is about um, the Black Marxist tradition and how much of that for you is important to think through these questions of world making. I'm thinking about C.L.R. James mm -hmm. um, and also perhaps Greg Moton's book *In the Break*. Mm -hmm. um, I don't often think of Moton as a Marxist, but. Well, I mean, he yeah, has such a beautiful reading through Hartman of, mm -hmm. yeah, of, absolutely. of um, objecthood. Absolutely. Um, and, and also his later work with um, Stephen Harvey. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Through. The undercommons, sure. Yeah, so like, I'm thinking about how they've kind of elaborated, because one of the most beautiful things about this talk was its beautiful historicization of both intellectual history, but also its own working history. So it's great. And so I was just wondering if, if that type of historicization of Marxist historicization helps you yeah, thank you, and and I appreciate you bringing world making. I mean that, and I assume you're getting that from the abstract, right? When I said this is theory in the mode of world making. Originally, the talk was all about world making and the variety of theory and the tensions of theory and praxis and how we can read those histories. And then I was like, what in the hell are you doing? It's Friday afternoon. People at least want to hear about the race and sexuality. Like, come on. 
And then I showed you that scene, so I don't know. Um, Even the bedroom is a world in itself, right? I mean, you, your, a lot yeah. of your argument today was about how that's, what makes that space yeah, yeah, yeah. possible. No, I appreciate that. And I, so, so there's more to be said about how I understand theory and what theory is doing here. And um, I'm happy to, not, to say more or not say more on that. In terms of the black Marxist uh, tradition, um, yeah, right? I mean, I think Cedric Robinson's work is remarkable. And I think it's remarkable particularly for really calling out some of the ways that Marxists in his 18th, 19th century European framework can never think slave trade, transatlantic slave trade. That's never going to be a piece of what he does. And so I think it's Cedric Robinson who I'm most connected with there in terms of what he does in, around the Marxist tradition. Um, that said, I uh, have uh, a good deal of my last book, which was on neoliberalism, um, took a lot of distance from the Marxist from the Marxist accounts that we seem to fall into very quickly. So I'm quite wary of trying to undertake uh, the kind of project that I want to do here around doors. And so I'll tell you, the two other doors that I'm, that I'm thinking a lot about are the, the doors, the pearly gates of Protestant heaven. And so I, I want to work on, Sylvia Winter has this incredible provocation that what you find if, through her view in the Renaissance period as we move into secularism, it's not that, um, that human replaces God, but that race replaces God. So I want to try to see what that's about. Um, and then the other one, of course, is the doors of opportunity, the door of opportunity, which the inverse, I think, is the prison gate. And so I think I've already sort of started along that. So my concern is the Marxist tradition becomes another way for white people to get off the hook. And to just, I mean, I, I'm, you know, <laughs> to, to just go into a class analysis that brackets everything that I'm trying to hear and listen <coughs> in this black feminist theorizing. So Moton's a different case, and why I don't think Moton's a Marxist and I don't read him as a Marxist is maybe we can talk about that on our own. Uh, yes. Well, I guess you give this kind of talk, you have to get these kinds of questions, don't you? Um, <laughs> as I'm not a fan of Marxist analysis, I'm also not a real big fan of Adorno. So I think that, that there, so, and I want to say something else about the whole European archive. Uh, so I, I um, sure, there are resonances between what Adorno and Foucault are up to, and I suppose I could use Adorno rather than Foucault, right? Which is your suggestion, I take it. But the reason I'm using Foucault is because he's been so influential to people in this academy studying sexuality, including queer theory. He's just been a huge impact. And so while you know, I'm really sympathetic to the work, of course, of Laura Ann Stoller and the way that she brings up the whole colonial problem of Foucault's project, I still take this to be a deepening and a rotating of his project in still a different direction. So why I don't use Adorno? Allergic to Marxism. <laughs> Second, um, I do want to say something about the European archive. For me, this project is so much about trying to move out of my own training. So I am steeped in European philosophy. I can, I can like re, I mean, I, it's where I've been trained deeply my entire education, beginning as an undergrad. And so a big piece of this is how to turn out of that without, it, it would be uh, foolhardy at best to suggest that I'm going to abandon it. That is never going to happen, nor do I think we ought to. However, I think it needs to be completely dethroned, and that dethroning is not easy. And so the way that I invoked Bataille and then I worked on Foucault, I, it's not going to go away, and yet it has to be not even secondary, sort of tertiary in terms of resources to think the things that I'm trying to think, which, uh, which for me is uh, just about a really, a really deep kind of uh, struggle around, around putting together and getting a new archive of theory. Daniel. 
Well, that may say something about your week. <laughs> it's not a very high bar, but I love the <laughs> Thanks so much. And so I just want to uh, get at the domestic regulatory grid here for a mm -hmm. second, right? Um, as is my want. And so I think of Nanella Miller Boyd's work, 2006, Wide Open Town, where she, in that amazing first chapter, talks about how those, um, those working class, edgy bars in 1905 in San Francisco and the, uh, the gender and sexuality transformations and, and uh, revolutions that are happening on stage actually are grounded in vaudeville and the minstrel tradition, right? So that white mm -hmm. transgressive gender and sexuality mm -hmm. can occur in 1905 in these spaces precisely because of the regulatory grid of white supremacy having a force behind it. I'm thinking about uh, queering the color line mm -hmm. in that chapter. So I just taught this morning. Right? So, so I guess, I guess my question is, what if, uh, what, what, what would you say about the fact that the threshold itself, not just entering the domestic regulatory space, the heterosexual yeah. domestic space, but the threshold between sexual deviancy and otherness and queer erotic and pleasure and that which is domestic and safe, what if that threshold itself is completely undergirded by this, right? And by exactly. the of no return. So I just wanted you to chat with us about that. Well, thanks for, for recapitulating my talk. Okay. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, not with all that great stuff at the beginning, but your last line is what I'm trying to say. Okay. So I should have hit you up earlier. It could have been a shorter talk. I think that it, that is precisely the question I'm asking. What if it is all? And, and I want to push and insist that it's not race. It's anti-blackness. Right. And I know that's getting me into all kinds of other hot water, but I'm committed to it. I am deeply committed to it. And, and, I, and I get that. And, I, and so in that regard, this is a total follow-on where I ended my last book, where people and scholars have said, now, are you sure this is race or is this blackness? What are you talking about? Now I'm clear. So what if this entire threshold is undergirded by anti-blackness? Then we have a very different understanding of the normative and the abnormative, right? The normative and the pathological. And so what we get in people like Somerville, what we get in this remarkable new book by, by C. Riley Snorton, which uh, I hear is circulating in our graduate students already, which I'm happy to hear, um, incredible book, is really fantastic work on exactly this problem, but mostly in the 19th century, okay? And so that's all good, right? And I'm not saying that I'm suddenly gonna become a historian and I'm gonna go do the work in some previous century, because I, I, don't, I don't think, I mean, were that I could, right? That I could, that I could do that kind of Herculean retraining. Um, however, I do think that it is, uh, so, so what I take this question to be is the same question that those scholars are doing, yet pushing harder on what the impact is for white affect. And so it really is squarely around, well, this isn't just, you know, this isn't just black theorists doing this for black communities or black consciousness. This is about our sense of modernity. And so then what does that do to everything we're doing? Which is why I can think a lot about the European archive. Well, I see she's left, but anyhow, perfect that she should leave. May the European archive leave. Um, <laughs> as a way of thinking about how it upends things. Lisa. Uh, thank you, Ken and Tom, for the wonderful presentation. And um, I want to preface this question by saying that I, that my knowledge of uh, sort of European philosophy and uh, not that a lot of the frameworks that you're talking about is very limited. But I wanted to say that I was really struck by the ending of your presentation when you talked about uh, sort of sexuality as being this apparatus that was approved for anti-blackness. And I couldn't help but think about how that seems so very fitting to the current moment. And not to say that this, this is a new thing, but that how it's become so hyper visible today. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you could maybe unpack that concept a little more and that. maybe if, if there is any sense of how this, since this is a current project of yours, any sense of how this is a, an important project for the moment, or maybe a political moment, or not. Yeah. I. Um, I don't know about the political moment, you know? I mean, I, 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 mean, I have plenty of opinions. Um, so much of my last book was geared on the current political climate and on the present, and I was really informed by Foucault's sense of writing a history of the present. 
and I find now that our, our contemporary moment is so ephemeral that, in other words, it's so fast that I find it, too, increasingly a distraction. And so I don't say that out of the privilege. I'm still going to be doing my part in the political sphere and standing up for what I think needs to be stood up for. And I certainly do think we're in remarkably dangerous, volatile times. I think we all probably agree on that. Um, but I'm not, yeah, so I've grown much more hesitant. That said, I'm not sure exactly what you're hoping for. I will say that for me, the Me Too moment has been very troubling, yeah. not only for the reasons that it's bringing out all the sexual violence, uh, and for a few reasons. One, I think we've blurred some crucial lines, right? Now that we have these, these new sets of allegations with the latest resignation, I mean, I haven't checked the news, so what's the latest resignation from the White House? I don't know, but you know, one of the latest was Rob Porter. That's sexual violence. That's domestic violence that we're seeing there. That's different from sexual harassment, which is different, again, from sexual assault, which is different, again, from non-consensual, blurry-lined sex. So I think all of these things still need to be looked at carefully. The thing that was most striking to me about the Me Too movement is that it began by a black woman. It began by a black woman whose name I'm blanking at the moment to my great, sorry? Thank you, Dr. Mitchell. Uh, and she began it as a mode of survivor uh, solidarity and survival work around supporting sexual assault survivors, supporting each other through that work for black women. And now it has become this huge thing of celebrities. And the other thing I would say is that a lot of it's tied up to money. So I don't know if that's where you're wanting me to go or. That's right, and so that's a good example, right? But even if that hadn't been its roots, I still find it an incredibly, and I know that I'm chair of the Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies Program, so heaven forbid, what in the world am I about to say? But, and it's being recorded, hopefully that's off. Uh, but that the Me Too movement is a distraction. Let's just sit on that and meditate on that for a bit, right? I mean, I mean, I'm for real. I mean, I mean, it is some serious stuff, and I get that. But it's also a lot of elite white women calling out elite white men for things that, in some views, they should have been doing differently. Now, I'm getting a little out of out of hand here. But what I what I'm what I'm trying to get at is how does sexuality then function as a way to distract us from some other core things that are happening, like immigrants' families being destroyed on a daily basis. That's happening on a daily basis now. Like mass incarceration and the destruction of black youth. That's a daily basis thing. Those are both easy examples that have been completely intensified under this administration, and yet we're hearing about this other thing. It's important, and I'm not trying to create a hierarchy, but my commitment is to thinking this other kind of problem. I'm getting in more and more hot water, Dr. Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> well, as much as there's nothing better than standing on a tirade, I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> there is a question. Okay, y'all need to check in on your pleasures there. <laughs> Well, we have a distraction. <laughs> yeah, there's something talking about. Um, yes, could absolutely. About materialism and matter and sexuality as well as race. Other sure. Than, other than the, um, there was just the one reference to the um, Colonel Blimp. Right, but there was also a reference to the, to the uh, messy, sticky, yeah, wet, thank you, uh, <laughs> matter of sex acts that have to be sublated through the door.
I'm reading that the one from for the French translation, but I'm reading it because it's like an ontology of matter. Anyway, I just wanted to make a comment that it's Okay. Okay. [laughs] I don't know that I'm gonna talk about an ontology of matter in the way that you might have in mind because I'm I'm not really in 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 trying to go with the new materialist kind of turn, which may not be what you have in mind, but um Mhm. So, what I'm interested in is uh base materialism. And what I'm interested in there is, and it's Bataille, and so I'll have to explain that a great deal more. But Bataille, who who is a, you know, who is mostly known as a French pornographer, that's mostly what he's known as, but he writes three volumes of political economy. And so here I am in the European archive. The, he argues, especially through the Gnostic tradition, he looks a lot at the Gnostic practices, um, for what he keeps seeing in that religious tradition, right? He's, Bataille's very interested in sacrifice and in sacrifice as the moment of transcendence. So there's always violence in the moment of transcendence for him. That there is what he calls a creative active matter that we call evil. And that in religious, in, in, in sort of, you know, orthodox senses of Christianity, particularly perhaps other religions as well, that where transcendence becomes about sort of moving away and getting away from that matter, what you find in the Gnostics is a reanimating of that matter. I don't think this is probably what you're after in your question, but that's where I'm thinking. I'm trying to think through what Hartman does in the Barracoon and why she spends so much time with the Barracoon in relation to what I'm also need to still, you know, do way more on, the abstraction of the mathematical. So it's about the move from the base materialism of the bar barracoon to the abstraction of the mathematical. In sexuality, I haven't yet mapped that out, but it's there to be mapped out. 